Welcome, Dr. Epic here. And today we're gonna to discuss FDR versus the Great Depression. And along the way, we're gonna meet bank robbers and fear and fireside chats and alphabet soup and blue eagles and sick chickens and the biggest party in American history. We're gonna follow that outline right up above my head. So put that in your notes to serve as a framework for the information that's to follow as you begin to build an answer to that question on the lower left. Did the New Deal save America? Using the historical events between 1929 and 1939, evaluate the success of FDR's New Deal, both economically and politically. Did the New Deal reverse the damage of the Great Depression or did it lengthen and deepen the economic crisis? What would be the opinions of Keynes and Hayek? Was the New Deal necessary to get the country through the 1930s? Did that thing, did the New Deal, actually work. Now, the story so far. The Great Depression begins on Black Tuesday, October 29, 1929, the crash of the New York Stock Exchange. And by the end of that day, it's lost 23% of its value. And within the next three years, the New York Stock Exchange loses 89% of its 1929 value. Herbert Hoover is the president, and he attempts to rectify the economic crisis and is not successful resulting in the election of 1932, where FDR paints the map of America blue and wins one of the greatest landslide victories in American political history. But America is in deep crisis when FDR becomes president because Franklin Roosevelt inherited a country in shambles. The banking system was in ruins. Hoovervilles proliferated across America. Large number of homeless and jobless people wandered from place to place looking anywhere for a job, looking anywhere for work. People were starving. And in fact, people had begun to starve to death. The entire American economy had shrunk by a third. Uh, the unemployment rate had hit 25% and was still growing. The middle column of the entire nation had turned into a giant new desert, the Dust Bowl, and prime agricultural land was now worthless desert. And FDR himself saw democracy on the brink, or people were willing to trade democracy for security, as they had done in Louisiana with the rise of the kingfish, Huey Long, essentially becoming the socialist dictator of Louisiana. But Huey Long was only one of the two most dangerous men in America. That's FDR's words, not mine. The other being General Douglas MacArthur, about which many people were fearing would stage a military coup against the government of the United States. And it wasn't just desertification in the Midwest. It wasn't just threats to democracy. It wasn't just an economic collapse because there was also a massive crime wave going on at the exact same time. A massive crime wave had begun and begun to spread across the nation, featuring daring bank robbers and kidnappers all of these guys were former muscle and bootleggers from the days of Prohibition. And these guys were really colorful characters. John Dillinger, there's John Dillinger right above my head. John Dillinger, pretty boy Floyd over there on the left, Machine Gun Kelly, Babyface Nelson, Bonnie and Clyde, that's them in the center. And even the Ma Barker gang, who together with her four grown sons went around knocking over banks all across the United States. Now, these robbers were aided and cheered on by ordinary people who saw these guys as striking back against a broken and failing system that was stacked against them. And when the bank robbers showed up, when they would, when they would shoot their way into these banks and rob the banks, people cheered the robbers. Because one of the things that these robbers started doing is they would bust into a bank, hold the place up for cash, and then set, then put a gun next to the bank manager's head and go, where are the loan records? And the bank, would, the manager would take them to where the loan records were and these bank robbers would throw gasoline on it and then a match. Because on their way out of the banks, these robbers would burn the loan records. They'd burn the mortgage contracts, freeing up all of the local farms from the debts that they owed these banks. People would tell the bank robbers, better hurry, the police are coming. Or they would trip the police running down the street. Ordinary people would block streets and block the police from chasing the bank robber heroes of the 1930s. All of this is the America that FDR inherits. Wearing a steel brace and having a lot of painkillers so he could stand, FDR takes the oath of office on March 4th, 
1933. And in his inaugural speech, he gives one of the greatest speeches in American history. And I'm just going to read a small part of it right here. So, this is what FDR says. First of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. In every dark hour of our national life, a leadership of frankness and vigor has met with that understanding and support of the people themselves, which is essential to victory. I am convinced that you will again give that support to leadership in these critical days. We do not distrust the future of essential democracy. The people of the United States have not failed. In their need, they have registered a mandate that they want direct, vigorous action. They have asked for discipline and direction under leadership. They have made me the present instrument of their wishes. In the spirit of the gift, I take it. And then FDR gives them exactly what he said, direct, vigorous action. FDR explodes into action. He summons Congress into a special session and sends them bill after bill, proposing entire new branches of government and massive, massive new programs. He proposed and got five major pieces of legislation passed in three months. Now, so energetic is FDR that this period of rapid relief is known as the 100 days, all caps, the 100 days. And it has become the standard by which the beginning of every president has been measured. Every president since FDR gets elected and they measure his 100 days against FDR's 100 days. Now, ordinarily a big bill, a massive piece of legislation, will take a new president a year or maybe two or sometimes three years to pass from conception to passage to signing it. It takes a long time to get a really big bill through Congress. FDR passes one major bill every 20 days for 100 days. His first major bill through Congress, five days. This is incredible amounts of speed. This is an incredible amount of legislation and arm twisting and convincing. And FDR does it. Every three days, just like FDR did back when he was uh, the governor uh, of New York, FDR directly addresses the people in these famous fireside chats. The American people had never heard anything like this. Every three days, FDR goes on the radio and he explains what is happening during the 100 days. He explains what they just passed. He explained what they prepare to pass. He explains what they're going to do next. He explains every single step that the federal government is going to do. And I want to pause for a second and just listen to his first fireside chat where FDR basically explains, you know, in seven minutes, we're not going to listen to seven minutes, but he basically explains the banking system to ordinary Americans. My friend, I want to talk for a few minutes with the people of the United States about banking. To talk with the comparatively few who understand the mechanics of banking, but more particularly with the overwhelming majority of you who use banks for the making of deposits and the drawing of checks. I want to tell you what has been done in the last few days and why it was done and what the next steps are going to be. I recognize that the many proclamations from state capitals and from Washington, the legislation, the treasury regulations and so forth, couched for the most part in banking and legal terms, ought to be explained for the benefit of the average citizen. I owe this in particular because of the fortitude and the good temper which everybody has, with which everybody has accepted the inconvenience and the hardships of the banking holiday. And note the tone of the president. It's calm. It's measured. It's authoritative. He's merely explaining exactly what they're going to do. And he's trying to break it down in very, very simple terms because he wants the American people to understand what he is doing during this hundred days. The American people had never seen anything like it. People are riveted. They're listening carefully to everything FDR did. This is a far cry from Hoover's three or four day fishing trips. And in doing this, FDR is calming the nation down. 
He's lessening panic and despair. He's calming their animal spirits. And Americans had never heard anything like this before. A president directly addressing the American people on a regular basis, every three days at first. FDR showed Americans he knew how bad it was. He knew what was happening. He knew there was a crisis. He knew people were suffering. And he was very carefully explaining what the government was going to do about it. The government hears you and it's on its way to help. Now, in the 100 days, FDR passes five major pieces of legislation, and here they are. One, the Emergency Banking Act. He shuts down all banks in the United States for four days. Every single bank in the United States is closed for four days, forcing them to kind of rework exactly how their finances are set up. And this is followed by bank insurance reform. No more of this bank's collapse and take everybody's savings with them. Two, he sets up something called the Civilian Conservation Corps, or the CCC. Now, the CCC is an open job for all men. Anybody can apply to work for the CCC. And they're going to work on nature conservation, trail construction, flood prevention. So a job if you're looking for one. Three, the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, the AAA. And that, the goal of the AAA was to fix the farm crisis through the federal purchase of agricultural goods. Four, the National Industrial Recovery Act, the NIRA. And the NIRA was to establish federal control of wages and prices of industrial goods. And finally, five, the Tennessee Valley Authority, the TVA. And this is a plan to build the largest hydroelectric project in the United States along the Tennessee River and provide electricity to large portions of the rural South. Mixing together the policies of Theodore Roosevelt's Square Deal with Woodrow Wilson's New Freedom, these programs, along with subsequent programs, become known as the New Deal. FDR saw this as a completely new relationship between the federal government and the American people. A new deal where the federal government would ensure employment, fairness, electricity, equal opportunity, and economic health to all of the American people. This is a very Keynesian approach to the economy. The government borrows massive amounts of money and then launches these massive spending programs. And what they're doing is they're trying to prime the pump to sort of kickstart the economy in order to calm the animal spirits of the people. Now, all of this massive borrowing will eventually cause problems in the long term. I mean, you can't borrow money forever. But long term tomorrow, tomorrow's problems aren't going to save the country today. And besides, as John Maynard Keynes himself you know, wrote, in the long run, we're all dead. If the country's dying now, there's not going to be a tomorrow to worry about. Now, some of these programs prove enormously successful. The CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, employed three million young men in the wilderness and forests of America. They cut trails, they improved rivers, they logged fallen trees, they constructed cabins, they constructed trails. Now, the pay was not great. In fact, the pay was pretty bad. It was $30 a month. But the CCC clothes you, it feeds you, it gives you a job, it trains you how to work in the great outdoors. It was enormously successful. Now, FDR went out and found the old veterans from the Bonus Army that Hoover had crushed. And they, he basically went to them and they're like, oh, are you going to gas us again and throw more tanks at us? And FDR said, no, I'm going to offer you a job. In fact, he hires many of the old veterans and gives them a job at the CCC. The veterans were going to oversee all of these young men working in the nature areas of America. And you can see that on the upper left. That guy in charge, the older fellow, that's an old sergeant directing young men how to improve a river, how to widen a stream. Millions of young men worked in the forests and parks of the country, overseen by these World War I veterans. Everybody got a job. And one of their main jobs involved going to the center of the country and planting thousands of trees, tens of thousands of trees, in fact, millions of trees. The CCC, all of these young men, led by these World War I veterans, they plant three million trees in a line between Texas all the way to North Dakota. 
right through Nebraska, right through Kansas. And I want you to cogitate on this for a second because I'm not going to tell you the answer. Why did the CCC plant 3 million trees in the center of America? What were they trying to reverse? Cogitate on that. And if you're into hiking and camping, even today, you know, you can go to these wilderness areas into these national parks and you see the remains of the CCC's work all over the place. Now, I would go to a lot of these trails when I was a little kid and I didn't understand what CCC was, but you see it all over the place, building bridges and trails and roads and paths. In fact, uh, at Bryce National Canyon, you can actually see these stone steps that they carved in bedrock. All of this was done, you know, ultimately to pay and give these young men a jobs, but ultimately to give Americans access to the unspoiled nature of America's wilderness. Now, the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, also a pretty big success. Now, the TVA consisted of an ambitious plan to build 12 huge hydroelectric power plants along the Tennessee River. Now, this would provide thousands of construction jobs for years, while also providing electricity uh, for you know, the next 100 years to very, very poor parts of the South. Yet, it also proved quite controversial as it entailed seizing the ancestral land of something like a quarter million people, some of whom were very, very sore that their family farm was being turned into the bottom of a reservoir. And it displaced a lot of these people in the middle of the Great Depression. So it wasn't an unmitigated success. Now, other programs were less successful, like the, the AAA. Now, the AAA promised that the federal government would buy up excess farm production in order to drive prices up and help out some of these farmers. And the Agricultural Adjustment Administration did this. And to some extent, it worked. Food prices began to rise, all right? And farmers began to actually turn a profit. Sometimes some of these farms turned a profit for the first time since like the early 1920s. But the thing is, is that what was the government doing with all of this agricultural produce that it was purchasing? So a farmer would raise, you know, 100 bushels of oranges and the government would buy half. They would have produced thousands of gallons of milk and the government would purchase half. They would produce hundreds of heads of cattle and the government would produce half. To keep prices up, the government couldn't just dump this material on the market because that would drive prices way down. So what was the government going to do with all of this food? And the answer is they destroyed it. Milk was poured directly into the ground. Cattle were shot and buried. Oranges were sprayed with kerosene and then lit on fire. Corn was burned for fuel. And in a hungry country, the willful destruction of so much food just proved absolutely baffling. Starving people would sit in movie theaters and watch newsreels of farmers just pouring milk onto the ground, throwing cheese into bonfires. The AAA was popular, but only with farmers. Everyone else absolutely hated it. And then finally in 1936, the Supreme Court killed it. The AAA was rated, un, was deemed unconstitutional and it was destroyed and nobody mourned it. Then comes the National Industrial Recovery Act. Now it sought to regulate control of industrial prices and wages. Companies would join the NRA, the National Recovery Administration. The NRA was part of the NIRA, if you're getting your alphabet soups all confused and thus allow federal government to control the price of goods and labor. And to say that they were in support of the NRA, they would put these posters up of blue eagles uh, next in the windows of their factories and restaurants, like that woman is doing right up above. She is proudly displaying the blue eagle of the National Recovery Administration. We do our part. But this is when the NRA starts to really fall apart. The government proved to be absolutely hopeless in trying to determine what exactly fair prices were, as they often just relied on what the business would say a fair price was. And okay, what is a fair wage? Well, they would just ask the business. And very, very quickly, the NIRA realized they were just rebuilding the trusts of the Gilded Age, except doing it with federal money and federal permission. And then the nemesis of the Blue Eagle came along, and it proved to be a sick chicken. 
This is the very infamous case or famous case of the Schechter Poultry Company versus the United States, 1935. Now, this was the case of the Schechter Poultry Corporation. Now, the Poultry Corporation was a business that specialized uh, in uh, proper kosher butchery of chickens. And the U.S. government set a price for the chickens. Every chicken is going to cost X amount of dollars. And the Poultry Corporation said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense because there's all different kinds of chickens. You've got big chickens, you've got little chickens, you've got fat chickens, you've got skinny chickens, and you have sick chickens. So you're going to tell me we have to charge the same amount of money for a sick chicken versus a big, fat, healthy chicken. And the government said, yes. So the Poultry Corporation goes, that makes no sense. How are we supposed to tell our customers this? Everybody's just going to buy the big, fat chickens, and we're going to get stuck with a bunch of sick chickens. And the government said, no, you have to randomly choose your chickens. And it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. So the federal lawyer is now arguing his case. FDR's lawyer is now arguing his case in front of the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. The government says all chickens have to be the same price. And the government lawyer said, yes. And then the Supreme Court justices say, how do you, how do you pick between a big, fat, healthy chicken and a sick chicken. And the government lawyer then proceeded to explain how the government regulations were going to involve blindfolding a, a, a guy who would randomly stick his hand in the chicken coop and feel around for the nearest chicken, thus making it completely fair. So, you know, if you went to buy a chicken from the Schechter Poultry Corporation, you didn't know if you were one day going to get a big, fat, healthy chicken or the other day a sick chicken. And as the government lawyer is explaining the government's sick chicken policy, he starts to hear a titter, and then a snicker, and then a guffaw. And then the government lawyer has to look up and realize that the Supreme Court of the United States has begun to laugh at the government policy over sick chickens. And when the, the greatest lawyers and judges in the country are laughing at you, you have lost your case. And the United States lost the case of the Schechter Poultry Corporation versus the United States. And the Supreme Court found the NRA to be unconstitutional. You can't do that. And they killed one of FDR's uh, prime main uh, efforts, killed one of his main economic plans. FDR don't care. Undaunted, he presses on. He creates the SEC and the FDIC, these financial institutions that are designed to prevent another Black Tuesday and designed to prevent another huge wave of bank failures. Uh, and that is the Security and Exchange Commission, which was created in 1934, the Federal Deposit Insurance Commission, the FDIC, created in 1933. And he also completely reorganizes the Federal Reserve System in order to release a lot of money back into the economy. You know, Hoover wanted to restrict the money supply. FDR opens the coffins, coffers and just dumps a ton of American money onto the open market. And it seemed to work. It worked. The money supply improved. Dollars began to arrive in these parts of the United States, which hadn't seen a dollar bill in years. And people were actually able to charge money for their goods and services. Nobody's getting paid in potatoes anymore. You can get your orange drink for five cents. That's not a bad, that's not a bad price for orange. And most importantly, FDR acknowledged something that people had realized years and years ago. Prohibition failed. And the 21st Amendment is passed. Prohibition is killed. And the 21st Amendment is a very simple amendment. It just says that the 18th article of the Amendment to the Constitution is hereby repealed. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's essentially all the 21st Amendment does. It killed prohibition. And then what happened was the greatest party in American history. Bars opened across the nation. Or really, the bars had never closed. They had just become mafia-owned speakeasies. And everywhere across the nation, people were able to get beer and alcohol and liquor. And for the next two or three days, the entire country was drunk. But the irony of the 21st Amendment, one of the real ironies of the 21st Amendment is that the final state that voted to kill prohibition was Utah, the Mormon state, and Mormons don't even drink. 
And to combat this huge crime wave, FDR reorganizes what had previously been called the Bureau of Investigation into the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. The FBI is created in 1934, 1935. And FDR empowers the head of the, F, uh, the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, no relation to the, pres the old president, to address the criminals and bank robbers that were running around the country, you know, holding up banks and burning mortgage records. Now, Hoover patterns his organization after the famous Texas Rangers, and he goes out and recruits a ton of World War I veterans, rangers and cowboys, to just straight up hunt down all these infamous criminals of the 1930s. And oh my goodness, do they hunt these guys down. In fact, it's argued they don't even really attempt to arrest most of them. Machine Gun Kelly is arrested in 1933, but John Dillinger, Pretty Boy Floyd, Baby Fails Nelson, even Bonnie and Clyde, they are just straight up killed uh, all throughout 1934. Uh, even though Bonnie and Clyde are killed by the Texas Rangers, not the FBI. Even Ma, the Ma Barker gang, uh, which is Ma Barker and her four grown sons, they're wiped out in a shootout with the FBI in, 19, in January of 1935. And the FBI just gets rid of all of these infamous bank robbers. But the question is, how did the FBI hunt down these guys so quickly? I mean, basically in, in less than two years, they wipe out this entire group of bank robbers and kidnappers. And it is, it's been rumored, it's been rumored for years that the FBI had help. And the help came from the Italian mafia, the mob. And the rumor is that the FBI made a deal with the mafia because the mafia was setting itself up to exist after prohibition. And the, F, the mob did not like all of these bank robbers. They were too violent. They were too high profile. They were too famous. So the rumor is, and I find it a really convincing historical rumor, that the FBI basically met with the mafia and said, look, you give us information on all these bank robbers and kidnappers, and we will not bother you as long as you play by a certain rules. You don't kill anybody who's not in the mob. You don't get your face in the papers. Um, you don't do anything to hurt the country, and you don't deal drugs. And it seems that the mob more or less played by those rules well up until the 1960s and 1970s because the FBI pretty much leaves the Italian mafia alone for the next 30 years. But despite its early failures, FDR's New Deal seems to be working. Yeah, the AAA had failed, and yeah, the NIRA had failed, but the CCC was hugely popular. The TVA was coming online, providing hydroelectric power to large parts of the South, and the banking system itself was recovering. Money was entering all different parts of the United States. Unemployment had begun to decline, dropping to 16% by 1934. And the economy grew in 1933, 1934, and into 1935. But, but, all of this was paid for by borrowing massive amounts of money. The government debt exploded. FDR spent $28.7 billion in four years. The United States had never seen spending on that scale. Such spending is simply not sustainable. Eventually, the government will go bankrupt, or it will have to print a lot of money and end up in this hyperinflationary cycle, just like Germany did back in the 1920s. And this is ultimately the problem with Keynesian economics. It is not sustainable. Eventually, the bill will come due. So people go to FDR in 1935, and they're like, look, you got to start turning down the spigot. You have to lower government spending, or you have to raise taxes. The government just can't go on borrowing this much money. But the problem is, doing that is going to cause an economic downturn. And FDR is running for election in 1936. But FDR gets a little bit of luck. He gets a little bit of luck. Now, remember, FDR identified the two most dangerous men in America, the two men that FDR thought were real and genuine threats to American democracy. Huey Long, the kingfish, the socialist dictator of Louisiana, and General Douglas MacArthur, 
this person about which there were all these rumors that he might militarily overthrow the government. FDR gets a break because in 1935, the Philippines asked for and received home rule. The Philippines are now a independent republic or a semi-independent republic. And man, this guy named Manuel uh, Quezon won the first election and becomes the first president of the Philippines. Now, President Quezon asks FDR, Quezon wants to build a Filipino military. So Quezon asks FDR to send him a high-ranking military advisor to help with the construction of this new Filipino army. And FDR knows the perfect person. Why, there's this military genius we have, and his name is Douglas MacArthur. He would be perfect for sending him to the other side of the planet to build the Filipino army, to build the Filipino military. And Douglas MacArthur is thrilled with the idea of building a military from the ground up. He loves it. And that's why FDR sends Douglas MacArthur to the other side of the planet. But he can't do that with Huey Long, the dictator of Louisiana. And Huey Long was mounting a serious challenge to FDR. Now, Huey Long had created the Share the Wealth Society and was spreading it out all across the United States, crisscrossing the country back and forth, giving speeches about share our wealth, every man a king. Because Huey Long was calling for a maximum income of $1 million, but also a minimum income of $15,000. Huey Long claimed that the New Deal had not gone nearly far enough and had solved far too few of the country's problems. Huey Long was prepared to challenge FDR in the 1936 election, and Roosevelt knew it was a serious challenge. Huey Long had a really good shot of becoming president in 1936, but he didn't because Huey Long was murdered on September 8th, 1935. An assassin named Carl Weiss went into the Capitol building of Louisiana in Baton Rouge, pulled out a handgun and shot Huey Long twice, bang, bang. And Huey Long's bodyguards, the infamous Skull Crushers, pulled out their handguns and their Tommy guns and proceeded to shoot Carl Weiss more than 60 times. Some of them reloaded and continued to pump bullets into his body. And as a matter of fact, it's actually rumored that Huey Long was actually assassinated in a marble hallway. And it's rumored that Huey Long was not actually killed by an assassin's bullet, but by the bullets of his own bodyguards ricocheting off of the rock hard marble. But Huey Long, victim of an assassin, dies in 1935, ending a really serious challenge uh, to FDR in the 1936 election. But FDR presses forward, and in 1935, in the run-up to the 1936 election, FDR announces a whole new set of programs, and this becomes known as the Second New Deal. Second New Deal, all caps. Now, the Second New Deal had three major parts to it. One, the Social Security Act, and the Social Security Act was going to allow a retirement pension for all Americans. The government was going to collect part of everyone's paycheck and then distribute it out to the oldest and neediest of Americans. Two, the, Nation, the National Labor Relations Act, the NLRB, and that would create a permanent board to mediate between business and labor. And finally, the Works Progress Administration, the WPA. And the WPA was based on the CCC, and it was a massive public works project. It was going to build roads, it was going to build bridges, it was going to build hospitals, it was going to build schools. It was going to employ anyone who was desperately in need of a job. But the critics argued that the point of the Second New Deal wasn't to help America during the economic crisis. The critics of FDR pointed out, look, the Second New Deal, the entire point of the Second New Deal is to simply get Roosevelt reelected in 1936. So FDR adds Social Security to the New Deal along with the NLRB and the WPA. And the WPA is based itself off of the CCC. Now this would make up for, for the failures of the NRA and the AAA, which then would add to the success of the CCC as well as the success of the TVA. And this would go along with the newly formed FBI. Now, I haven't really mentioned his minor programs like the PWA or the uh, NYA or even the RA or the REA or the FHA or the EMIC. Now, each of these uh, programs is quite important, but if you are lost in the alphabet soup of the New Deal, you are not alone because 
no one could keep track of all of these programs that FDR was making. As a matter of fact, if you see on the upper left, people made fun of this. They're like, FDR just shuffles three letters in the morning and that's the agency he creates by the end of the day. And all of this massive spending was coming out of borrowing. The government was borrowing all of this money to create all of these crazy new, you know, all of these crazy New Deal institutions and administrations. But it doesn't matter. FDR wins. He wins an even bigger victory in 1936 than he did back in 1932. As far as the Americans are concerned, as far as the American people are concerned, the New Deal is working. It is slowly saving the country. Things are looking better and better. Yeah, the government's borrowing a lot of money, but that's not actually going to make the economy collapse, is it? And then the economy collapsed. The economy collapses in 1936, 1937, wiping out almost half of the gains all the way from 1933. In 1937, the economy contracted and the nation was right back into the Great Depression. Unemployment shot past 20%. The entire economy shrank by 3.3%. It's like everything that Roosevelt had done for the last two years, gone. Did the New Deal fail? Well, maybe, maybe not. It certainly, the New Deal did not create sustainable economic growth. That's one thing you can absolutely say. When the economy collapses in 1936, 1937, that sort of argues against a lot of the, the success of the New Deal. And the money supply became restricted again. Large parts of the country by 1937, 1938, again, were reduced to this really primitive barter economy once more. People just sort of threw up their hands. They're like, we're right back where we were. You know, why didn't any of these, these programs create sustainable economic growth? Why is that? Why do we have this Roosevelt recession, you know, in the middle of the late 1930s? Why? Now, this remains really heavily debated among historians and among economists, like exactly what happened. Now, John Maynard Keynes and, and Keynesians argue that FDR's attempt to slow federal spending caused the Roosevelt recession. In other words, Keynes argued that Roosevelt simply didn't spend enough money. Who cares if it required more borrowing? Just do it. Frederick Hayek argued the opposite. Hayek argued that really, if you're looking at the Great Depression, the Great Depression wasn't a normal business downturn. The Great Depression had been caused by the federal government. The, the Great Depression had been caused by Hoover's disastrous actions back in 1929-1932. And all of Roosevelt's spending had offered relief, but it had just generated massive government debt and inflated the currency. So after the election, FDR was forced to either curtail the money supply and, and prevent hyperinflation. And when he curtailed the money supply, that triggered the Roosevelt recession. It triggered the failure of sustained economic growth from the New Deal. In short, Hayek argued that the New Deal of 1933, and especially the second New Deal of 1935, created the Roosevelt recession of 1937. Because to Hayek and people who read Hayek and like Hayek, the New Deal didn't work. The New Deal was never going to work. It was all about the money supply, not about stimulating demand. But, in a second counter argument, the country was like in really, really bad shape in 1933. So much so that people were willing to trade in democracy. People were willing to trade in to exchange democracy for security like they had done in Louisiana. People were desperate. Who cares what the numbers wanted? It was the psychology of the nation that really mattered. It was the political structures that needed to be supported. Not so much the economic ones. And maybe the New Deal was more psychological. Maybe it was more of a political success than an economic sense. I mean, I don't know. No one really does. Maybe, maybe. But by 1937, the nation is right back into the Great Depression, back to where it was in 1932. Unemployment was sky high. Money had disappeared from large parts of the country. And Roosevelt, like Hoover before him, was getting more and more frustrated that his policies weren't working. And one clear contribution to the Roosevelt recession of 1937 
was Roosevelt's constant demonization of business. People, business leaders who had worked with him in 1933 and 1934 now found themselves being called enemies of the peace in 1936-1937. Again and again, FDR blamed the business owners for the failure of his policies, and he gradually alienated them from the economic plans of the late 1930s. And this is what FDR says about those business leaders. We had to struggle with the old enemies of peace, business and financial monopoly, speculation, reckless banking, class antagonism, sectionalism, war profiteering. Never before in all of our history have these forces been so united against one candidate as they stand today. They are unanimous in their hatred of me, and I welcome their hatred. FDR didn't question his own policies. He blamed the business leaders of America. And he had constant squabbles with the Supreme Court, constantly squabbling with the Supreme Court. Every time the Supreme Court would knock down one of Roosevelt's propositions, he would directly attack them. He would criticize them. And eventually he tried to completely reorganize the Supreme Court itself. He moves to pack the court with pro-Roosevelt judges. And this ends up being a massive disaster for Roosevelt. And he eventually had to retract his assault on the Supreme Court and admit that the Supreme Court was correct. Some of his New Deal programs were simply unconstitutional. I mean, they laughed at his lawyers. By 1938, by 1939, it is obvious that FDR was going to do something no president had ever succeeded at. FDR was going to run for a third presidential term in 1940. No other president had succeeded, but a number of them had tried. Sam Grant had tried, Teddy Roosevelt, even Woodrow Wilson had tried to go for a third term, but none of them had succeeded. But given the Roosevelt recession and Roosevelt's constant fighting with the Supreme Court, it is really, really unlikely that FDR would have actually won the election of 1940. But in the years leading up to the election of 1940, the late 1930s, something very, very different was going on. Because, you know, we've talked about this alphabet soup of the, of the New Deal, the, the WPA and the TVA and the FBI and the CCC and the AAA and the NRA and the NIRA. None of that mattered. By the time you get to 1938, 1939, only three letters started to matter. People only thought three letters were important. And those three letters were W-A-R. Because by the late 1930s, the world was getting very, very scary. Very terrifying things were happening on the other side of the planet. And when I mean terrifying things, I mean really terrifying things. Nazi Germany was rapidly expanding across Central and Eastern Europe. Soviet Russia, which had emerged from the ruin of the Russian Civil War, was declaring war on its enemies, fighting a war with Poland, fighting a war with Finland. And on the other side of the planet, Imperial Japan was waging a horrific genocidal war against China. America was really, really worried about WAR. And the thing is, we didn't really have an army. The United States had largely disbanded its army after the Great War, after World War I. And Roosevelt springs into action, rapidly building entire, entire new regiments, in rapidly rebuilding the American military. Thousands and thousands and millions of rifles, tanks, jeeps, entire new battleships were under construction because people were scared. And Roosevelt's calm voice won him the election of 1940. It wasn't as big of an election as he, as he had had back in 1936, but it didn't, didn't really matter. People were scared, and they wanted those three letters in charge. F-D-R. Now, we've arrived at the end of this lesson, and you should have all the information you need to answer that question there on the left. Did the New Deal save America? Using the historical events between 1929 and 1939, evaluate the success of FDR's New Deal, both economically and politically. Did the New Deal reverse the damage of the Great Depression, or did it lengthen and deepen the crisis? What would be the opinion of Keynes and Hayek? 
Was the New Deal necessary to get the country through the 1930s? Did that actually work? But it's a very new world that Roosevelt finds in the 1940s. But we'll discuss that next time. And I will see you there.